This is the philosophy of Rick Sanchez. Just hit a button, Morty. Give me a beat. Oh, man. Okay. All right. Um. Oh, yeah. Rick Sanchez is a total and utter nihilist. He obviously doesn't believe in any god or religion. But on top of that, he's the smartest man in the universe, and as a result, also the most powerful man in the universe. This means that unlike other people, he's not motivated by climbing any power hierarchies, since he's already at the top. Rick also has the power to travel between dimensions, and therefore he's hyper aware of the insignificance of his own universe, and his relationship with his family. After all, if there's an infinite number of Beths, Mortys, Summers, and Jerry's, then what does it matter if anything happens to them? What about the reality we left behind? What about the reality where Hitler cured cancer, Morty? The answer is don't think about it. In fact, his family is not even his original family. His real daughter was killed by Rick Prime, and his dimensions Morty and Summer were never born. The only person Rick feels any attachment to is Morty Prime. So how does Rick go on living? Rick is shown to be depressed and existential throughout the series. In spite of that, however, he goes on living. He invents adventures and fights like hell when his life is endangered. The question is whether he clings to life basically as a result of instinct or whether there's a coherent philosophy to Rick Sanchez. The following might include disturbing content. Viewer discretion is advised. For the most part during the show, whether or not Rick has a life philosophy is left unaddressed. However, in episode 4 of season 7, the Suicide Spaghetti episode, we're presented with a coherent explanation of Rick's nihilistic philosophy in the form of delicious carbohydrates. In the episode, we are shown that Rick has been, quote, making spaghetti for his family once every week. Judging from the reactions of Rick's family, the spaghetti is very, very good. Real. Party, rustic, wholesome Italian food. Rich with tomatoes, nice texture in the meatball, and a perfectly cooked <laughs> me. Perhaps almost suspiciously good. This time, when Rick goes to get more spaghetti for seconds, Morty, who figures there must be some sort of secret behind the spaghetti being so great, follows Rick and is welcomed by a hair-raising sea. Rick is in his garage, elbow deep in a corpse's guts scooping out spaghetti from the dead man's insides. Morty is understandably horrified. Ah, uh, no, why? Why? No, why is it always this shit with you? He has been eating people without his knowledge for weeks on end. Rick uses his spaceship to take Morty to another planet and explain that on this planet, when people die by suicide, their insides turn into Gordon Ramsay-approved spaghetti. Demonstrating it with a tour of the morgue and opening up some corpses, since apparently Morty is a visual learner. Their cortisol increases the starch content in their bloodstream, changing their intestines into one long spaghetti noodle and the surrounding tissues into a spicy sweet hematoma that we would call a bolognese. It's all very scientific. Rick and Morty then visit the funeral of the latest suicide victim, whom the family were gleefully eating earlier. Where feeling guilty, Morty confesses everything to the crowd present, explaining how suicide victims on their planet turn into spaghetti and that people on Earth love eating it. After the confession, the duo head back home. That should do it, buddy. Everybody enjoy your closure. By sharing this information, however, Morty ends up inadvertently incentivizing the powers that be to create a gloomy atmosphere in order to increase suicide rates and profit off of a universal suicide spaghetti trade. Oh God, I'm a murderer! Morty pleads with Rick to stop the spaghetti craze. I promise to stop. You what? If you help me. I, I promise I'll never look under the curtain at a Rick thing to figure out what's bad about it ever again. Rick tries two different solutions, both of which fail, including Never Let Me Go clones that turn out to be conscious, which would be equally, if not more sketchy, and soulless meat blobs programmed to stab themselves, which nobody likes, for various reasons. Hey. Oh, where Wait, are you? You're gonna blow yourself up? Do well, it. you clearly have a morally superior position. Eventually, Rick comes up with a scheme to end the spaghetti trade forever. Rick tells the president he's going to synthesize suicide spaghetti by euthanizing one last volunteer. He then broadcasts the last euthanasia volunteer's memories to the whole planet. The man's name is Fred Bunks. Now Fred, just think about your life. This machine will put it on screen for everyone to see. In Fred's memories, we learn that he loved two things ever since he was little. Eating strawberry jam straight out of the jar with his hands, 
and building things with a bad version of Legos they had on their planet called Constructs. In high school, Fred falls in love with a girl named Amber. Fred dreams of becoming an architect, and in order to follow his dream, he has to move away from his high school sweetheart and go to university in another town. They try to keep the relationship alive by doing long distance, but both Fred and Amber seem unhappy. He ends up cheating on her and they break up. Amber later ends up marrying another man, and Fred moves back in with his parents, who are now old. After old Mr. and Mrs. Bunks pass away, Fred gives up his dream of becoming an architect and instead invents an improved version of the Not Legos we saw earlier. Basically the same version we're familiar with on Earth. Not surprisingly, his invention is a big hit with children. Despite his success, however, Fred is lonely. He scrolls on the planet's equivalent of Facebook and accidentally finds his former girlfriend, Amber, on the website. The two are reunited. They meet up in a bar where Amber shows a picture of her husband and children to him. After some ups and downs, Amber gets a divorce from her husband so she and Fred could be together. So they get married and grow old together, and Amber picks up Fred's habit of eating strawberry jam with his hands. When Amber passes away, we see Fred leaving a jar of jam next to her gravestone as tribute. In the final vision, we see Fred's view of the city landscape of high-rise buildings we can infer he has built. By this point, the euthanasia chemicals have taken effect, and the old Fred, current Fred, and the emotional montage die together. Rick cuts open Fred's stomach, takes out a forkful of spaghetti and says, Bon Appetit to the people watching. Everyone is disgusted by the display. People across the galaxy projectile vomit and proceed to boycott suicide spaghetti. I think I can speak on behalf of my people. We've had enough spaghetti. And the suicide spaghetti farming business ceases to be. Rick then delivers this speech. It wasn't the death, was it? It was the complexity of life. You're asking whether this was a story about right and wrong. The answer is, I don't care. Cells consume, Morty. Life itself is wrong, and that means death is right. But you can't side with that, so you live, even when it means eating. And Fred here really did it well. Fred really did it well because he fulfilled his biological destiny by choosing to feed. The jam destroying the other guy's happiness to reunite with the girl he loved and the suicide spaghetti are all parallel. In simpler words, Fred ate his fair share. In order to live, we feed on and destroy other lives. That aspect of life is inevitable. Farming plants and animals both involve killing. The only escape from more killing is death, but there's no point in collective suicide either. Even if all humans were to be wiped out, the animal kingdom would still go on with the slaughter day after day. And if all life on Earth disappeared, that would condemn the future generations that were never born. You might face some challenges finding reasons to live, though in most cases that aren't like Rick's, it is doable, even if you have to rethink it once in a while. But we have a clear reason not to die that is baked into our biology. So we trust instinct and keep on living. We turn a blind eye to the cruelty of industrialized farming and the cruelty of the world at large. We use our electronics and keep on eating steak. It's like Camus said, I've heard of a man whose friend had been in prison and who slept on the floor of his room every night in order not to enjoy a comfort which his friend had been deprived. Yes, we shall all be capable of it one day, and that will be salvation. Thank you all for listening.